Story 1. I used to work at a dining hall at a very large university. I did this for two years, and most of the time, it was very relaxed and enjoyable. However, occasionally, we would encounter challenging or immature students. We had a special room that was vacuum-sealed, known as the worry-free room. It was specifically designed for students and associates with food allergies. This room had signs all over the door and windows stating that it was for people with allergies. To access this room, you needed a special key card, which you had to pay for. Every other month, we would have students begging to be let in, not because they had allergies, but because they claimed it was a safe space. I can recall the managers telling people to leave, and security was even called twice to have them escorted away. The worst incident occurred when a student with dyed blue hair demanded to be led into the worry-free zone. We refused because we needed to keep it exclusively for people with allergies. She was told to leave, and she huffed off. Or so we thought. Two hours later, we heard screaming. The managers rushed out and found a student on the ground in front of the worry-free zone, going into anaphylactic shock. We acted quickly, thankfully, and they were taken to the hospital, treated, and were okay. Security contacted campus police, and an investigation was conducted. Five days later, service workers, which is what I was, were told to always wipe the doorknob of the worry-free room as we passed by it. It turns out that the woman with dyed hair was seen on camera wiping peanut butter on the doorknob. She wanted to prove that this place wasn't for people with allergies, but rather a safe space. She ended up getting handcuffed and arrested. A college student wanted to prove that we were wrong by almost killing another student with a severe peanut allergy. That still makes me wonder if going to college is worth it, with people like that being able to attend. Story 2. This happened last night. I frequent an outdoor archery range at a large state park. The range doesn't have an on-duty safety officer, as there are only five lanes, which is fine because 99% of the people who shoot are extremely professional and polite. This was actually my first negative experience in about two years. I had the range to myself, and as I was knocking and drawing an arrow, a random child came out of nowhere and ran into the range right in front of me. I retracted the bow and turned around to see a mother and another child casually walking up to the tables behind the lane. One of her sons had a children's compound bow, and the other had what appeared to be a wooden toy recurve bow. Both were between the ages of 7-12. The exchange went like this. Me. Hey, ma'am, I'm going to need you to control your children if you're out here. They can't be running onto the range when someone's shooting. Mother. Oh, it's fine. It's just you out here. Just don't shoot if they're out there. They won't be shooting next to you anyway. Me. No, if I'm shooting, they can wait for me to finish my set before they go out there. That's how this works. Mother. Don't tell me how to mother my children. This is their free day, and they beg to come out here. At this point, I decided to be patient. I was the only other person there, had already been shooting for an hour, and just wasn't in the mood to argue with someone. So I continued and kept glancing over to the older son, whose little arms couldn't handle the extreme tilted 20 pounds draw of his bow. This child was flagging everything as he struggled to draw a compound bow with his fingers. I figured I'd attempt to help him out. Me? Hey, man, I have an extra release in my bag, It'll definitely help you draw that easier. Mother, what did I just say? Don't tell my children what to do. Me? Hey, he's obviously struggling. I don't want to get shot either, and he's come pretty close to that too. Mother, if you attempt to talk to my sons again, I'm calling the park police. I should have just left, but I love archery too much, and it was a beautiful day, so the child gave up. I stopped paying attention to them and continued my business. About five minutes later, I was about to set my bow down when something flew past my face, maybe five feet away. I turned around and saw this lady's children running around behind the range, shooting the bows at each other. Me? Ma'am, not only did your children almost just shoot me, but if a ranger drives by and sees that, you're going to face a pretty hefty fine. Mother, they're just toys. It's fine. Me? No, it's not fine. The police aren't going to see them with toys. They're going to see two children shooting at each other with bows. You're lucky I'm patient. Mother, I'm done with you. I'm calling the police. Have fun rotting in jail when I tell them you threatened us. Me, excuse me? You know what? Fine, I'll wait here. Long story short, 
The park officer who showed up was actually a regular at the archery range. He recognized me, thankfully. He took a statement from both of us and ultimately banned the woman from the range. She also didn't have a permit to be there in the first place, so she got fined as well. Story 3 A few years after I started my business, I was asked to clean up and optimize a number of personal computers in multiple locations, as well as set up some forms and templates for a new client who owned a local restaurant. The work, all labor apart from a little travel, was performed over the space of a month due to scheduling conflicts and school holidays. Upon completing the last of it, the client confirmed verbally that he was happy with all I'd done and to go ahead and send an invoice. I duly emailed an invoice for a sum just in excess of 400 pounds. I waited for payment but never heard anything. I sent reminder emails, called, and left messages, but received no response. Eventually, a couple of busy months had passed, and I met the client by chance in the local supermarket. When I asked why he hadn't paid or been in touch, he said that all the computers were as bad as they had been before I'd started, and that he had tried to contact me with no success, as my landline and mobile phone had caller display as well as answering services, and there had been no emails. I knew the latter was nonsense. As any computer user knows, a system can easily go back to its previous state if the user's bad habits don't change. So I contacted a local debt collector, gave him the details, printouts of my call logs and post-invoicing emails, and he took them to the restaurateur. On his return, his words were, he's not disputing the invoice. He's saying that the work wasn't done right, so it's his word against yours. I asked if it was worth taking the guy to small claims, to which the debt collector said, even if you could prove he confirmed he was satisfied with the work. They might insist you get his computers back to their pre-invoice state again. Do you really want to spend more time doing that? Of course, the answer was no. So I thought it over in my mind and came up with a plan. At this point, it was late November. So, creating two throwaway email accounts and female names, I got in touch with the restaurant to book a large party for Valentine's night, the following February. I put it down as... My husband's surprise 40th birthday party confirmed that my husband's sister and copied her in the message with the other throwaway couldn't make the journey north but would happily pay the pound 10 slash head deposit as her share towards the night. Of course, as time went on, the ideas grew arms and legs. The numbers attending increased until the owner suggested he'd reserve the whole restaurant for the evening and they'd happily arrange the seating to suit us. But could I ensure the deposit was sorted as soon as possible, please? Of course, I confirmed that the sister was a scatterbrain and that I'd ensure the check was with him very soon. He emailed the sister using the copied address, and she confirmed it had been posted. To keep him on side, I asked for a proposed menu in advance so that I could send it to all the attendees for pre-ordering. Naturally, they were delighted that they'd know this, as it makes their life much easier. Consequently, the numbers for all three courses were emailed in with a few fussy eater variables thrown in for good measure. Needless to say, by the beginning of February, he was getting quite anxious about there being no sign of the deposit, but I reassured him that the sister's check must have been lost in the post, so she'd send another by special delivery if they could ensure someone was there to sign for it. I knew the owner lived about 25 miles away, and the restaurant didn't open until 5 p.m., so he'd have to come in very early and hang around waiting for it. A week before the day, and he'd obviously had enough. He emailed in a spat saying they'd turned away numerous inquiries, had no deposit, and could no longer hold back on taking other bookings. This time, I didn't bother replying. My part was done. My wife at the time and I were booked in at another restaurant close by for our own Valentine's meal, after which we took a walk past the restaurateur's business premises to see just two cars in their parking lot, one of which was his. I'm not sure how much he must have lost out on that night, but knowing his prices... I'd bet it was significantly more than the pound 400 plus I'd invoiced him. Of course, lessons were learned by me as well. Getting written or emailed confirmation of job satisfaction for one, and not letting new clients go unbilled for too long was another. Naturally, I had no hesitation letting all and sundry know how he'd behaved either. So he was blacklisted or forced to pay up front for any work by information technology professionals and other professionals I knew locally. Story 4 it was the mid-1990s. My father was a highly paid business consultant. The company he worked for would hire him out to businesses that were trying to get off the ground. He would fly out, spend a few weeks with them, and train their management in the finer points of business ownership. 
He also handled large projects, such as the planning, building, staffing, an organization of new offices, and other such tasks. For this, his company would charge anywhere from $300 $400 an hour for his time, billed by the week at a minimum of 40 hours a week or more if there was overtime. In exchange for this substantial sum, the company took care of all of my father's expenses, rather than push them off on the client. This went on for years. My mom quit her job to stay at home with me, and my dad held down the finances of the household himself. But he was gone for three weeks at a time, and when he was here, he was at the office. I was lucky if I spent any real time with him more than two days a month. This also negatively affected my parents' marriage. Then for my sixth birthday, my dad got me a model plane and a membership card to the airline his company used. In truth, it was a copy of his card, but six-year-old me thought it was the coolest thing ever. It had my dad's name on it and the word Admiral. Bringing his concerns regarding his home life to his boss, my father had struck a deal. I would be flown out to him every third or so weekend. My father would pay the cost of the flights but would use his company account and thus have access to his frequent flyer discount, company discount, and would collect any loyalty points or whatever that I earned. I was flying for pennies on the dollar. I would spend the weekend with him in whatever hotel we were in, and we would go and do stuff in the city. He got to see me. I got to see both him and a new city, and mom got to spend a weekend without me to decompress. Everyone loved the arrangement, myself especially. Fast forward a year. I have achieved admiral status within the airline's loyalty program. Not a hard task as my dad already had that status and I was using his account. But I felt accomplished nonetheless and have been to all 48 continental states. This is when something happened. There was a change in the company. People moved around. People were hired and people were fired. And when all the dust settled, my dad found himself one position higher and under new management. Dad's new manager had no issues with the father and son getaway perk my dad was liberally using. But to offset the extra cost, there would be a few changes to my dad's expense account. While food and entertainment were fully covered as many of his meetings happened over lunch, the manager decided that rather than provide my father with a rental car, instead he would take local transport, via cabs or similar services, and would be given a limited number of trips he could take a day. Surely he only needed to travel twice a day too and from the site. So he was allotted two cab rides per day when he was out of state, including weekends since the manager wanted to be generous. Any additional travel my father wanted to take would be on his own dime. My dad brought up that the company was not spending any resources on my trips. Aside from the 30 minutes of time, it took the travel agent to book my flights. But this new manager insisted that this was a much better use of company time and resources. All other expenses, including the hotel, dry cleaning, and any mail that had to be sent, would be covered as usual. Now, normally, my visiting weekends would be jam-packed with whatever local museum or attraction the city had, followed by a nice dinner at a cool or fancy restaurant. One does not achieve this with two cab rides a day. My dad uses all his cab rides on my next visit. We go and see everything. A museum, a movie, an affair of some sort. Every trip was by cab. This is the part I remember because my dad had me keep count with him. An entire amazing day was spent, and in total, 11 cab rides were had. Now for the malicious compliance. Without any more allotted cab rides, after I was sent home, my dad was still scheduled for a week of work. He contacted the local post office and explained his situation. After some mischievous laughter from both him and the postman, a truck shows up at his hotel. He mails himself to work and then back again for the rest of the week. He pays for first-class delivery by the pound. This becomes exorbitantly expensive. At the end of the trip, my dad sent in an expense report that had a few thousand dollars extra on it for shipping costs. The fallout, there was a change in the company. Some people were moved, some people were hired, and some people were fired. My father found himself under a new manager. The company decided that it was improper to have different rules for expenses for different employees based on their status or tenure. A fixed policy was enacted company-wide. My dad's new manager had no issues with sending me out once a month on my father's business account, as long as my father paid for the cost of the flights 